Hello. Thank you very much. Guatache, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Douglas Glandon. I'm a senior evaluation specialist with the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, or 3IE. And I'm joined by my colleague here, Anka Dumitrescu. And I just want to apologize for the delay in getting started due to some technical difficulties. Um, but here we go. So just a um, framing of the presentation. Reflecting on the theme of the symposium, qualitative evidence for informing decisions in the SDG era, this presentation takes a slight or introduces a slight plot twist. So this is qualitative evidence in impact evaluation for informing decisions in the SDG era. If this will work. Quick announcement while we're waiting. If you are planning to go to the dinner, Thank you. please make sure to pick up Does that make? Ah. Okay, this one is working. Okay, as I was saying, if you're planning to go to the dinner tonight, please make sure to pick up your restaurant voucher from the registration desk just outside. You'll need that voucher to enter. Are you are you advancing? Are you advancing it? Are you advancing it? Okay. Okay. In the presentation, I will briefly talk about impact evaluation and causal inference, but I won't spend too much time on that. That's something you're probably familiar with to some degree. Then I'll spend most of the time talking about examples from the field of using qualitative evidence and mixed methods to inform impact evaluations. And I'll wrap up talking about a few examples of online resources and repositories that 3IE has that you may find interesting and also that some of the people in the live uh, webcast may find useful. Okay, impact evaluation and causal inference. As a little bit of a backdrop for the discussion of impact evaluation, I want to tell you a little bit about how 3IE was founded, for those of you who may not be familiar. In 2006, the Evaluation Gap Working Group highlighted the fact that though billions of dollars were being spent on development aid, we actually had very little understanding of whether or not that money was producing the kinds of outcomes that were expected. So money being spent, but no real clear picture of whether it was being usefully spent or wasted. And one of the problems 
was that there were far too few impact evaluations being done. And of those that were being done, the quality tended to be poor. So fast forward two years to 2008, and 3IE was founded, essentially to help fill in this large evidence gap for social programs in development aid, and also at the national level of countries around the world. So if you were to summarize the mission of 3IE in just a question, it would be what works, for whom, why, and at what cost? And I just want to say also that uh, though we are focusing on health in many of the sessions here, uh, 3IE focuses on a variety of sectors. So health, nutrition, water, hygiene, agriculture, education, energy, economic policy, uh, social protection, and so forth, as well as multi-sectoral issues. So the idea is impact evaluation across, a, across these different sectors. This pyramid summarizes the main things that we focus on at 3IE, and each of the levels builds on the one below. So we spend a fair bit of time and effort and energy trying to do and support impact evaluations. And impact evaluations obviously give you a sense of whether or not there was an effect for a particular program that can be useful for refining that program, but sometimes doesn't tell you about whether or not that type of program or initiative or intervention would work in a different context. So we also do systematic reviews to synthesize evidence across impact evaluations so that we can have more confidence about whether or not a type of intervention will work on a broader level and that can be used to inform policy as well as programs in other contexts. On top of that, evidence gap maps are something that 3IE created to help give a picture of where for a particular topical area there's a strong evidence base and where there is a gap in evidence. So the evidence gap maps visually display systematic reviews and impact evaluations of a particular topical area. So at a quick glance, you can see for which types of interventions and for which types of outcomes there is evidence to let you know whether or not that is effective. And in that interface, you can actually access all of the underlying studies uh, directly. And finally, at the top, we have our evidence portals, which make it easy to access all of those items below, as well as uh, working papers, guidelines, other kinds of documents, um, and so forth. And just the, to summarize a little bit about what we've done in the 11 years that we've been around, the bottom row has a series of numbers. So those numbers represent 15 evidence gap maps created, uh, 50 countries in which impact evaluations have been funded, 50 systematic reviews, 50 members of 3IE as a network that includes funders, NGOs, and governments. 250 impact evaluations funded, 700 systematic reviews in our repository, and about 5,000 impact evaluations in our repository that are open and accessible to anyone who wants to look at them on the website. Okay, so let's just pause and reflect on the word or the term impact evaluation. Sometimes when people think about the term impact evaluation, they imagine a scenario a little bit like the one in the cartoon. So we see there's somebody on the left, an earnest researcher conducting an evaluation, asking, we're just starting our evaluation, which methods should we consider? The other researcher on the right answers in a very open-minded way, all of them as long as you choose a randomized control trial. Right? This sort of reflects an idea that when you think about impact evaluation, people sometimes get the idea that there's this community of people who love randomized control trials and spend most of their time searching for questions that they can answer with randomized control trials, almost as if they're living in a sort of RCT methodocracy. But that's not 
our focus at 3IE. We emphasize pragmatic thinking where research questions are driving the methods. And the pragmatism paradigm uh, reflects this sort of epistemology. You may have heard of, in some of the other sessions, discussion of epistemology. For instance, positivist or post-positivist epistemology or interpretive uh, or constructivist epistemology. Okay? The idea with pragmatism is that you're de-emphasizing questions about what is actually true in a philosophical sense, and you're more focused on figuring out how you can best answer your questions at hand. In addition, in addition, it's important to think about the research that you do as a form of social action, not just as an exercise to gain information. It's part of this, this paradigm of thinking. And because of that, you have to think about the implications of choosing one method over another. So something I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, that certain kinds of methods will be useful in raising the voice of marginalized communities that don't normally get heard. That's a choice that researchers can make as to whether or not they want a method that will do that. Other implications with respect to methods may have to do with balancing precision with the timeliness of when results will be available. It's possible that there may be a time window in which the results will be most useful for informing a policy. So it's not just about finding the truth, it's also about so what happens after that. And this table sort of exemplifies the idea of trying to make sure that you are focusing on the question first and matching the method. These authors put together this table with the idea that some methods are more conducive to certain questions than others. So on the left side, they have identified a series of types of research questions. And across the top, the columns represent different kinds of methods. And according to their view, the more pluses there are in this table, the more conducive that method is to answering that type of question. So for instance, looking at effectiveness, the first type of question, they're saying that randomized control trials and systematic reviews are very important. But in contrast, if you look at questions related to process or salience, appropriateness and satisfaction, they're talking about the importance of qualitative research. Okay? I just want to mention also that this table is not definitive, um, nor is it comprehensive. Um, and case in point, one thing it does not adequately capture is the importance of having methods to adequately capture cost data. Because if we want to know how effective something is and we want it to inform policy, we also have to know how effective or how, sorry, how expensive it is so that we can figure out how best to allocate resources. So that's something that probably should be added to the table. Okay, so let me just pause and ask a question. How many people in the room have designed or conducted an impact evaluation? Just raise your hand. Okay, a few. Um, how many are familiar with the methods for rigorous impact evaluation? Okay, a few more. And how many people understand what the idea is of an impact evaluation, but maybe not that familiar with all the specifics of the methods? Okay, okay, great. So a good mixer, mixture of people. I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's important to go through a few uh, assumptions to make sure that we all have a clear understanding about what we mean when we say impact evaluation. Okay, so in this slide, we're talking about impact evaluation as looking at changes that occur in targeted outcomes that are attributable to a particular intervention or program. In other words, changes that would not have happened otherwise. This is something I think we're probably all familiar with. So in the diagram, we're imagining that we're looking at an outcome on the y-axis and we're tracking that over time on the x-axis and we can see a group of people for whom the outcome is sort of gradually increasing. Let's say it's this group of people with their own characteristics and 
and demographics and context. And what we want to know is, if these people receive the intervention, how much better off are they? Or how much do their outcomes change? But the challenge is that we can't give these people the intervention and not give the intervention at the same time. They can only get one or the other. So we end up comparing these people who receive the intervention in blue to people who do not receive the intervention in the orange box. And these people have different characteristics. This is the fundamental challenge. It's the fundamental problem of causal inference is that there may be characteristics between the groups of people that explain the reasons for the difference between the orange line and the blue line. And that is what we're trying to address with causal inference methods. And there are a variety of methods. You've all heard of randomized controlled trials. You may also have heard of non-experimental methods, like looking at instrumental variables or propensity score matching um, and, and so forth, regression discontinuity. And the purpose of these methods is to make your control group or your comparison group as similar as possible to your intervention group so that you can actually compare the two in a meaningful way in order to attribute what you've observed to your intervention. So this is, we do this primarily, or the methods primarily do this quantitatively. So it helps us determine an effect size and statistical significance. And if you leave it at that, that's pretty much what you're getting. However, we're also interested in trying to understand and describe why, how, and in what context those changes occur, and to, under, to learn about unmeasured factors. So in the diagram, you can see we want to know about context, motivations, experiences, unintended consequences, and so forth. And that brings us to qualitative research, qualitative methods and mixed methods. So this is a topic that has been growing in popularity in the past 10 years, 20 years. And almost like this person in the diagram, there's this idea, there's, a, there's this feeling that there's intuitive value in taking a little bit of qualitative and a little bit of quantitative and mixing them together to increase the validity and insights from research. Right? They have different, they have different types, they're different types of data and they have different things to tell us. Uh, however, as this interest in mixed methods has grown, there's also been a lot of publications about how to do it, how to do it well, guidance documents, protocols, typologies, and so forth. And coming out of that is a very strong me message that it's not really enough just to mix a little bit of qualitative and a little bit of quantitative. It doesn't really work. So in this example, if we take this, this researcher example of, of just adding in both of those together, we could almost imagine that if those two vials get poured into that flask, there's going to be some sort of like explosion or maybe some volcanic eruption is going to come out. 